All right, here we go. Study guide for exam number two. Exam number two, as you can see, is 50 questions. The topics and the breakdowns I did for you. Immunity has about 45 questions. Infection has one. Cancer has six. Cardiovascular lymphatic, 19. <clears throat> Respiratory, 19. Very heavy, as you can see. Autoimmune, we have about one, two. So let's get started on this breakdown. I hope you're all well. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. So chapter eight, alterations in immunity. So yes, there were a few questions on the last exam. There are a few on this one too. Okay, and I'd put a little review on the last one and here we go with the next one. So with immunity, our immune system is very, very important. Our immune system starts basically when we're born and our immune system sends out these seeker cells that sort of scope out the material that is our, in our body and gets used to it and familiar with it. So then when things come in that we are not familiar with, in other words, antigens, <clears throat> we can fight them off with our immune system. So some of the top, and there's tons more, okay, to it, but this is a review. So go over the structures that you may need to remember, like lymph nodes, lymphatics, locations of those, um, bone marrow, just to get familiar with it. This is a review. This is kind of touching on the topics that you'll need to know. So the problem with our immune system is sometimes it goes haywire. Sometimes it's hypersensitive. And hypersensitivity has sort of been found to be triggered by specific things, by um, an overreaction of certain immunoglobulins. And they've been grouped into four types. And you could see those groupings in the correlated immunoglobulins, immunoglobulins there. And what are immunoglobulins? I'm having trouble saying it today for some reason. Those are the proteins and complexes that are created by our immune system to fight off these infectious agents. So you could see the triggers with the type here. I would know that and the immunoglobulin that is associated with that. <clears throat> Food allergy, bee stings, rheumatic heart disease can be triggered by either one of those. Rheumatoid arthritis can be triggered. I'm, I'm sorry, a hyper reaction of those, I should say, not triggered by. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis, we don't know the trigger. That's an autoimmune condition where our body starts to damage its own tissues. Somehow those searcher cells that I told you about when we're infants go haywire and start to attack our tissues. Rheumatic heart disease, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. That's actually a, a condition where it starts with an infection. It can actually lead to the heart. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then type 4 can be triggered from, um, for example, poison ivy. Uh, delayed rejection of a transplant tissue can trigger this and those T helper cells go a little bit crazy. And we have a hyper response per se. Type 1 is rapid. <clears throat> um, type 2 is intermediate response. And then type 4 is more of a delayed response. You know, people who get infected, per, for example, with poison ivy, kind of get it everywhere because they have it on them. They don't realize it and they spread it and it doesn't show up for a little while. Okay. So this is when something may be introduced to a patient or there's an infection or an autoimmune disease in the body overreacts. That's a hypersensitivity reaction. That's something also to keep in mind with autoimmune issues. Autoimmune issues is when the body almost loses its recognition of a tissue and attacks it. Much like in rheumatoid, your body attacks its own joints and you get deformation of those joints, okay? So let's talk about allergies. <clears throat> so allergies have different... Okay, urticaria is not always associated with an allergy, but it is always associated with histamine. Some of this got a little convoluted. I apologize with that. So allergies tend to 
trigger the release of histamine from those mast cells that we've talked about before. So someone is exposed to something, suppose you have a dander allergy with dogs, histamine is released, histamine can cause a various and sundry amount of side effects, congestion, coughing, etc. Okay, you're going to carry it. There's different forms of this, as you guys know. Know that histamine <clears throat> is strongly associated with urticaria. When you have that response to whatever the trigger may be, you release histamine in a localized area and you get the itching and the rash. You can also get bronchoconstriction with the release of histamine. And quite often that can trigger, say, allergic asthma. Autoimmune, I touched upon this last time. Please reference that material. Know some common autoimmune disorders. One that we're going to look at is SLE as an example of autoimmunity. And lupus erythritis has what's called a wolf-like rash that goes across the nose and the cheeks. Here goes lupus. I think that's the um, biological name for a wolf. And it's one of the outward signs of it. <clears throat> The anti-nuclear antibody lab test can be positive with SLE. It can also come up positive with other autoimmune issues. It can also, I've heard of patients having it positive than negative, which is kind of weird. But anyway, that's more of a side note. <clears throat> um, review alloimmunity, immune deficiency, and anaphylaxic shock or anaphylaxis as a response to um, an allergen. All right, some of these, you're gonna have to work for some of these things, so you gotta look up those definitions, okay? Blood typing, I would like to talk about briefly, and I don't even know if you have <clears throat> questions about blood typing, and why do I have it in here? Oh, because of reactions. That's why. Okay. So blood typing really shouldn't be an immunity. Okay. I put it in there because of hemolytic disease of the newborn. This is when um, an O negative mother has an O positive baby. They can actually develop antibodies against the baby. And this is why we do the blood typing. <clears throat> so this is seen with an O negative mother and O positive baby. Okay, so once again, this really should be in with uh, blood vascular, but I want this in there because it's hemolytic disease of newborn, also known as urethroblastosis fecalis. You may have learned it as that. And the mother <coughs> develops antibodies against the baby. And you can unintentionally abort the baby. This is why we have rogam. Mm, I believe that's how you spell it. Yes. So this is why we have rogam. Um, like I had to do this, and I believe it may have changed because you know I had babies a long time ago. But the mother's given an injection, and then once the baby is delivered and blood tested, if they're O negative, you don't have to get the second injection. Okay. So O negative. And the basics with blood typing is whether you have on the surface of a red blood cell, you have antigens or not, okay? So if there are no antigens at all, just to give you a baseline, it's O negative. There's nothing. This is what I have. And so because I have no antigens, and don't forget, an antigen is an irritating substance to our bodies. It's something that's come from the external environment. If our body doesn't recognize it, it attacks it. So I can give to anybody. I have nothing on the surface of my cells. There is nothing to trigger anybody's immune system <clears throat> on my red blood cells. Okay? Rh factor, let's start with that first. Easy. It's positive or negative. Negative mean there isn't any. Positive mean there is. <clears throat> so if we have O positive, <laughs> K 
can talk about I can't draw it. Oh, positive. There are, on this cell surface, proteins that represent the positive factor of RH. Okay? So, if I were to get this cell, somebody who's O positive, my body would say, what the heck are those little positive things? And build up antibodies against it, clot it together, and you form blood clots. Okay? <clears throat> so, once again, with O, nothing. So, let's talk about the letters. A has A on it. I'm really simplifying this just so you understand it, okay? It's not little A's on the surface of cells. I'm just trying to make it easy. B has B on the surface. And then we also have AB. <clears throat> so guess what I can get as an O negative person? Nothing. Me. O negative. That's it. Can't get O positive. Can't get A, whether it's positive or negative. Okay, and don't forget there's also the RH factor. There's B, positive or negative. Can't get that, lucky me. And there's AB, really can't get that, right? But if you take a look, now that I've drawn it out, <clears throat> guess what AB can get? Everything, right? Because it has B, it has a plus, it has an A, it has a plus, it has a plus, right? Those don't stand for anything. Okay, so this is why typing is so important. You have to make sure because if it doesn't coordinate with your blood type, you can actually clot and form clots in your bloodstream. Okay, so a little sidebar. Anyway, and once again, I'm not even sure there's questions on that on the test, but I feel it's important for you to know. Okay, so AIDS is caused by the HIV virus, which depletes the body's. Whoop, sorry about that. Ooh, I really went right T helper cells, <clears throat> okay, decreasing the immune response. It allows opportunistic infections to affect that patient. They can get very, very sick and, of course, progress to death. Um, it's bloodborne pathogen, has what's called a retrovirus. <clears throat> so what that will do is actually revert back into the DNA and change the genetics of that um, of the proteins that are made by that cell. Okay. So D, uh, C, D, four TH cells. Know those. Know why they're important and what happens to them with someone who has HIV. Okay. So once again, gotta go do some work. Antibodies, immune mediated response. So these are those immunoglobulins that we create. And okay. so these are the proteins that are created when we have some sort of antigen that comes into the body. You know, our um, immune system recognizes it, goes through its whole thing and then we'll create antibodies to fight off whatever that effect is. And there's different types that are formed. IgM is generally seen with a primary response when it happens when we're exposed to that antigen. IgG is a secondary response, but it's a major circulating antibody. It's the largest amount. IgE is seen with allergic reactions, okay? And then your book goes into IgA, I think, as well. Um, but these are the ones that I want to focus on. And there's a great write-up that I've given you a link to if you'd like to read about those further. So if we have an infectious agent <clears throat> that comes in um, that doesn't cause an allergic, allergic reaction per se, IgM will be the primary response, IgG will be your second response, and they'll both work together to try to fight off that infection. Here we go. IgA is seen in um, external secretions such as saliva, um, and then IgD, I didn't list because the exact function is not thoroughly understood. 
All right, review innate, active, and passive immunity, how each is gained, and what do they mean? All right, that moves us on to infection. There's good bacteria. I want to touch upon that because it is such a neat topic lately. Um, it's called the microbiome. And we need to have good bacteria. As much as a germaphobe as I am, there's good and there's bad bacteria. I'm on a little bit of bad bacteria makes a good bacteria better, but I still am a germaphobe. I can't help it. <laughs> so even though not addressed in the course, I just think it's such an interesting topic um, for your own advocation. If you're into health, you might want to check out the whole concept of your microbiome. And, and the majority of it, I believe 70, 80% of it lives in our gut. Um, and that makes sense. Think about it. Whatever you eat has germs on it, goes into your gut. Your gut has to deal with that incoming food and determine what's good, what's bad, kill off things that are bad, keep what's good, mediate what's medium, <laughs> and move on. Okay. So direct and indirect transmission. We reviewed that in exam one. Vaccines. General principles. Variance is... Um, you can replicate, replicate, grow, and um, become um, contagious for us. Okay, so review that. And then with vaccines, it uses parts of the virus to activate our body's immune response. It's basically giving us a little bit of an antigen, and then our bodies create an antibody against that. It provides, relatively speaking, long protection. Um, however, they may need to be given again. So if you can't last in a million year, but it does need to be given again. But then all the MMR ones are given once. So um, relatively long, long lifespan for these vaccines. Um, know, the, know the basics of inactivated and live attenuated and messenger RNA vaccines. Okay. As far as infections go, Review bacterial versus viral. And, you know, I, I don't mean like their structures and whatnot. Um, bacterial <clears throat> infections are things that we can treat with antibiotics. Viral, we can't. We all know that. We've become um, more acquainted with that because we're realizing that giving um, antibiotics for things that are viral is actually hurting our microbiome, which I spoke about earlier. Okay. Um, I truly think this is something that happened to me. I had horrible skin when I was young and way back in the 80s. Way back, um, people my age are laughing right now. Um, they just gave me antibiotic after antibiotic. I mean, I was on them forever. And I just think it killed my like, microbiome. And I had all sorts of intestinal issues now. That's probably TMI, but it helps you to remember. So um, <clears throat> endotoxin versus exotoxin. So these are bacterial toxins with different effects on cells and immune responses. Review this link below on how they express their toxicity and what type of bacteria they are involved with. Um, and so, hold on. Ah, there we go. Okay, so an exotoxin um, are proteins that will be produced inside pathogenic infectious bacteria most commonly gram-positive bacteria as part of their growth and metabolism. They are secreted or released to the surrounding environment to go up to your body or wherever they're infecting. Endotoxins are lipid portions of the lipopolysaccharide. You don't even know what, need to know what that is. Basically the cell wall. And uh, these are gram-negative bacteria that break apart. And those little bits and pieces then are the infectious agents that will go out and infect the body or whatever it is that they are infecting. Okay, so those are two good basic explanations that you should know. Okay, and then once again, define variants and understand it. Oh, God, cancer, it just, it, it's a horrible, horrible disease. Um, and I've lumped all these chapters together. There's a little bit from each one of the chapters, um, but I kind of just put together a review in this entire little sections here, including these three chapters. So obviously it can create multiple issues depending on the location, severity. And of course, I think you understand this, but all of us have cancer in us right now. Normally our cells will 
destroy it, that our immune system seeks it out and fights it off. Unfortunately, every once in a while, it starts to grow and take hold and it can spread and divide. So normal, these are just normal cells and they start to divide abnormally and they lose their ability to stop replicating when they should. Normal cells will touch the next cell and go, okay, this is as far as I should go. It's called contact inhibition. With cancer cells, they're like the bossy cell. I don't care. I'm going to keep growing and replicating and taking over this tissue. <coughs> and it's a basic gist of these cancer cells and how they divide and invade into other tissues. The cancer cells can grow out depending on where they are into the surrounding tissue. And what makes the difference is whether it's encapsulated or not encapsulated. Um, if it's encapsulated, it's harder for them to get out. But like, for example, the pancreas is not encapsulated. So the cancerous cells can kind of just go a little crazy with the pancreas. That's why whenever I hear somebody has pancreatic cancer, I'm like, oh gosh, I can't even stand the thought because it is um, very, very difficult because it can escape. It's not encapsulated, it starts to go a little crazy, but it also can get into the blood supply from the pancreas because um, the pancreas releases substances out to the bloodstream it's very vascular for the reg um the not the vascularity but the substances it release are insulin and glucagon so it's very close to our blood supply so if there's cancer in the pancreas it could get into the blood supply cancer can also get into the lymphatic system and go through the bloodstream and through the lymphatic stream so um just awful disease now benign tumors don't metastasize into surrounding tissues Often they have a capsule around them. It limits them to a localized area. Doesn't mean they can't cause issues. Um, for example, you can have encapsulated benign tumors in the brain. <laughs> it still can push on the areas of the brain. And what I always teach my a &P students is nerves don't like pressure. So these benign tumors can put pressure on nerves and cause issues. So malignant tumors, as we said, can spread. They're highly mitotic. Don't forget mitosis is replication of cells. <coughs> this allows it to be more destructive <coughs> in general than benign tumors. Okay, so cancer terminology, I'm going to have you look a bunch of these up. Neoplasm is a growth. It can be benign or malignant. Um, an example would be a lipoma. Lipoma is a fatty tumor, okay? Um, so understand that a neoplasm can be benign or malignant. Common roots of malignancy can be blood, lymphatics, into the surrounding tissue, as I said. In situ is <clears throat> cancer before it becomes invasive. So they haven't spread from the location where they were first formed. Oh, I forgot to grab, I grabbed a bunch of stuff from online. I'm sorry, I don't remember where I got this from. Anyway. Although they may later spread into normal tissue and become cancer. Okay, so it doesn't mean that they're not going to spread, but for right now, they're in one location. Cancer staging, this is essential for you guys to know. Okay, um, so know that, you know, zero, there's either no cancer, it could be abnormal um, cells like dysplastic ones on the cervix. Um, this is also called carcinoma in situ, stage one, small, one area. Two and three, it's larger, is grown into nearby tissues and or lymph nodes. Stage four means a cancer is spread to other parts of your body. It's also called advanced or metastatic cancer. And there's a link. Um, I also think nothing um, is asked of you on the exam for the TNM system. Um, this... Here we go. This is something I teach in my other classes. I'm not sure if you'll see this on your boards or not, honestly. But TNM simply stands for tumor node metastases. Um, and I just, I would review it if I were you. Okay. And there's, um, you know, zero through four is the reading for tumor. Node zero through three metastasis is either zero or one there is or isn't. So just for future reference, you may see that in the 
in the future on a boards or something like that just so you're familiar i think that's super easy to memorize too so it would take a second to do that um okay so common cut once again make you do a little leg work common cause of cervical cancer what are the hpv types which one can cause cervical cancer probably most of you know that already types of cancers listed below you will need to know which of these are affiliated with sun exposure tobacco and gyn okay so review those please yes okay. all right Structure and function of the cardiovascular and lymphatic system. Um, this is a big one. I believe there's like 19 questions. So there's a little bit more in here, and I added a bunch of questions. If you've looked at the pages and seen there's 20 pages, it's because I probably put about 10 to 20 charts in for pictures. So yes, it's a long review, but there's a big chunk devoted to the pictures. It's just the heart, please. Learn the chambers and the valves. Oh, sigh. When people don't know them, it drives me nuts. So the heart not only supplies the body with oxygen, it pumps nutrient-rich bread throughout the body. So what happens is the inferior vena cava comes up through the liver, gets nutrient-rich fluid, goes right to the heart. That's where that nutrient-rich food comes from. The other thing that the heart does is it helps to pump waste from the tissues to be excreted after nutrients are used. So you start at the heart. Okay. I think I went through this previously. I'm 90% I'm sure we went over this in the last review. So I'll go through it really quickly. So you start at the heart. You have your fresh blood, your fresh oxygen. goes out to the aorta. goes to smaller arteries, smaller arteries to capillaries, and it exchanges. Oxygen nutrients go to tissues. Wastes are picked up. Picked up, waste and carbon dioxide, go back through the venous system, pass through the liver, get nutrients, get to the heart, heart pumps to the lungs, gets oxygen, gets back to the heart, and is pumped out to the body. I know that's really fast, but you should know it. And if you don't, go back and look it up. Know that systemic circulation and the pulmonary to respiratory circulation. Okay. Heart's anatomically complex review, okay? Heart to the lungs, back to the heart, out to the body, back to the heart. Boom, boom, boom. But you know this path, the easier you can help your patients. Review the four chambers, the four valves, where valve sounds are. Of course, you know those. Review the blood supply to the heart muscle itself. This is known as coronary circulation. It provides blood to the heart muscle. It's its own separate blood supply, okay? And as soon as I say this, you'll be like, oh, okay anterior descending right here okay left coronary artery interventricular artery anterior descending i know there's a couple different names for it so both this left and the right coronary arteries you can't see it here but they come right off the aorta okay and they give nice fresh blood supply to the heart tissue here so suppose somebody gets atherosclerosis which is and I have a picture I'm going to show you in just a second, which is the fat that builds up on blood vessels, uh, let's say here. And it becomes thicker and it becomes thicker and eventually it gets completely blocked. Anything beyond this can die off and infarct. That's myocardial tissue infarction. So what they have to do is either, you know, do a bypass or stents <clears throat> crazy um and a bypass is simply they take um part of what's called the greater saphenous vein maybe there's new techniques i also know that they were taking a vessel off the chest plate and putting it and they bypass it they'll either take that little bit of a uh, bit of the greater saphenous and connect it here and bypass that um blocked artery or uh, there was something where um or a sternal? I can't think of the name of the blood vessel. It comes off the chest plate and they can bypass from there. It's pretty cool. So I brought that picture in for this. You should on your own 
review these vessels, inferior, superior vena cava, arch of the aorta, different parts of that, pulmonary trunk to pulmonary arteries, you should know these, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, yada, 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 okay? But I mostly put this picture up for the coronary vessels. Here's a picture of atherosclerosis and its progression. I know I have it further in the notes, but I really want you to correlate it with myocardial infarctions. So what happens with our body is with inflammation, um, which our body fights inflammation every day. When we're stressed, we're more inflamed. Chronic stress, we're more inflamed. Um, a lot of um, foods can cause inflammation. Breads, pastas, all those like white foods, um, bad fats. Our body starts to wear down. And the lining of blood vessels, so this represents an artery. I know because it says it, but also because it's nice and thick. Arteries are nice and thick and have a muscular layer. So what happens is that inflammation on the inside scratches the inside of that surface. And when it gets scratched and damaged, it draws plaque to it. Um, and that's a whole different topic. That's the gist of it. And then plaque draws more plaque and plaque draws more plaque and plaque draws more plaque. And you get what's a, called a little rupture here in the plaque, which can actually attract a blood clot. So you can have complete blockage with atherosclerosis and or you can draw a blood clot there, which will completely block this off. Either way, whatever tissue is beyond that, and of course, this can happen in places other than the heart. Um, I dissected a cadaver. I love this story. And as we dissected him, we realized he had a bypass from his subclavian down his thora uh, thorax, down his ribs, down to both of his legs. Because the bottom of his aorta, where it splits, was completely blocked. And, and we found this all out kind of through the process of dissecting him. Um, that was a really cool, I know that sounds weird, but experience to find that. So this can happen anywhere and it really likes to happen where blood vessels split because there's more turbulence there. Okay, so troponins, what are they? Well, they help diagnose, create troponins. You really could have troponin from any muscle, but our focus will be cardiac troponins. Um, T and I. <clears throat> Are proteins that control, hold on a second, sorry, it keeps jumping ahead. Calcium interactions between actin and myosin. Okay, let me let me break that down for you. All that means is actin and myosin are the tiny fibers in the muscle cells of your heart that when they contract, contract your heart. And they need calcium to do that. Okay, so calcium helps them to contract. And I'll show you a picture that may help in just a second. Um, <clears throat> cardiac forms of these regulatory proteins are created by specific gene. So these are unique to the myocardium. That's what that's coming down to. And there's the link there. Okay, so troponin T and I, I'm sure most of you have already dealt with that. But here's the logistics of it. And you know, we're not gonna get too crazy. Know that calcium, you know, know the types of troponin, know that calcium facilitates these processes. And you can see actin and myosin here. The little fibers, actin and myosin, and we have five of these fibers in our smooth and our skeletal muscle too. And so what will happen is myosin will actually pull these actin fibers towards each other, shortening them. I should say shortening the cardiac tissue and causing a contraction. So if you imagine all those moving in and shortening, they're shortening all of this muscle at different times and causing it to contract. It's way too much. That's what happens there. Now, troponin binds to these and helps them to contract. So if we have... If we have an excess of troponin that shows up, there could be some damage in there. Okay, to that. So, um, so no those two troponins. Okay. 
So here's a general look at the heart on the inside. And if we take a quick look here, we have the atria here, right, left atria. Um, that's plural, atrium is singular, right ventricle, left ventricle. Left pumps to the body, that's why it's nice and thick. Okay, the aorta comes off of it and goes out to the body. Uh, right pumps to the lungs to get more oxygen. Okay, right and left, I cannot, I don't even know why I try to. Okay. okay. In order to make this coordination of all of these muscle cells, we have to have a really solid system. And the system for this is an electrical system um, that we're going to go over that you can actually see on EKG. And it, it's not nerves, it's hyperexcitable cells that fall through this pattern. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the sinoatrial node. Sinoatrial node is the pacemaker. Okay. So let, let's go through this now. The electrical system of the heart are these hyperexcitable cells located at very specific locations. We're going to go through these steps. Sinoatrial node creates the pace. It's the pacemaker. It's what establishes our 60 to 100 beats per minute. If you have another location, take it. You won't have that normal 60 to 100 beats per minute. It's called an ectopic focus. I don't even know if they call it that anymore. That's how I learned it. But if you have an abnormal regular heartbeat, it could be that it's got another part of the heart regulating its beats per minute. Okay, so um, SA node pacemaker 60 to 100 beats per minute. The pathway of this conducting system moves down the heart, passing through the atria, which causes them both to contract, then to the ventricles, causing them to contract. This keeps the blood moving in the correct direction. You don't want it backing up. Backed up blood causes blood clots. And you can get it circulating in one of those spaces. And when it circulates, it clots. We don't want that, as you know. Okay, so SA node. Is here, sinoatrial node is here. It sends signals to the right and the left atrium. Okay. It then triggers the atrial ventricular node, which then sends signals down the bundle of his. Um, they may not be calling it his anymore. I'm not sure. Um, the newest edition of my anatomy book, I forget what they're calling it. They're trying to get rid of all the doctor's names that name stuff after themselves. It's just it's always kind of funny. But anyway, um, probably anybody my age to 10 years younger than me will know it is bundle of his. Okay. Anyway, the cells that come down the center will then divide into a right and left bundle branch. That may sound familiar. Um, those are typical areas to get myocardial function blocks damage to the tissue that blocks that ability to pass the signal through. Okay. So left bundle branch, right bundle branch, and then it wraps back up as the Purkinje fibers. Okay. So this whole electrical system keeps blood coming into the atria, out of the ventricles, into the atria, out of the ventricles. So we don't have it circulating here. We also have the valves, which you should remember. Okay. These are your atrioventricular valves that we see now with what are called the chordae tendinae. These are your heartstrings, chordae tendinae. Okay, here is your bicuspid. Um, from what I understand, they want you to say mitral. That's what a cardiac surgeon told me. And tricuspid. Um, it's called bi because there's two flaps, tri because there's three as a sidebar. And then we can't see aortic and pulmonary because those muscles are cut away. So we could look into the heart, but you should review them. Okay, let me. So here's an EKG. We're going to keep it super simple. Okay. An EKG has, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, P wave. 
QRS complex in a T wave. P wave are when the atria contract. QRS complex are when the ventricles contract. And it makes sense because look at how much more muscle tissue are in the ventricles. They're going to create more of an electrical circuit. T wave is when the ventricles reset themselves. So what this is showing is the movement of electrons, okay? Um, very different from an action potential if you've recently taken a &P, but it's still charting the movement of electrons. So this is when um, electrons are making the atria contract. This is when electrons are making the ventricles contract. And this is when the electrons are, or ions, I'm sorry, ions, basically are returning to where they should be. They create electrical activity. And this is in the ventricles. Um, the atrial resetting is hidden in this ventricular depolarization or contraction. Okay. And it gives us a ton of information. You know, if this is missing, there might be some sort of AFib. Um, a bag of worms uh, means you're in big trouble. Nothing, dead, right? Anything in here, ventricular. So um, give us a ton of information. How many beats per minute? You know, if you have the whole... Um, EKG rather than just one segment. So it can give us a lot of information, but that is a very, 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 very basic setup. Okay. Heart rate and rhythm. So briefly, we're going to talk about sympathetic current, sympathetic system. Super easy. Sympathetic, well, not really super easy, but I'm going to keep it super easy, is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. So if your heart rate increases, um, because you're scared, it's sympathetic facilitation. If your blood pressure increases because you're scared, sympathetic facilitation. If you're chilling out, having a meal, parasympathetic. You know, it has to balance itself too. You can't have one extreme or the other all the time. Um, you've got to have a balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is like, hey, I need to get out of here. I'm in trouble. Parasympathetic is like, hey, I need to heal after running away from that bear. Okay, so... Think about that and things that sympathetic could do and parasympathetic could do. Okay. Systemic circulation. These are the vessels. Oh, I'm jumping because of the pictures. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. Vessels that lead away from the heart. So I'm talking about from the heart to the body to the heart. Arteries lead away. It's always remembered it from the heart with oxygenated blood. Turn to smaller arterioles, which lead to capillary beds. You exchange nutrients and oxygen there. Capillaries will then, don't forget, resorb CO2 and waste, lead to small veins called venules, larger veins. Sorry, I can't help myself. And lead back to venules, which are small veins, which turn into larger veins, which lead back to the heart, passing through the liver to get nutrients bringing the oxygenated blood back to the heart to be sent to the lungs, okay? Now, there is something called a venous reserve. Um, we don't use up all of our oxygen. We have approximately 50 to 75% left. Um, that's why for years they were saying instead of doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth with CPR, you could just do chest compressions, which you can do. It'll circulate that oxygenated venous reserve. So... As the inferior vena cava produces whatever picks up nutrients, goes back to the heart, then it gets its oxygen, cycles again. So, blood vessels have many layers. The innermost is called the endothelium. This is what I told you gets damaged with inflammation, and then fats can deposit. This creates that process called atherosclerosis. Okay? Atherosclerosis can cause damage to multiple blood vessels. And as you probably have noticed and or know, um, <clears throat> diabetics tend to have a lot of vascular damage because of this atherosclerosis and because of higher levels of sugar. Sugar causes inflammation in the body. Sugar can damage blood vessels, make them rough, allow fats to attach to their walls, and it leads to more atherosclerosis, more damaged blood vessels, um, more peripheral loss of sensation, diabetic neuropathy, just a multitude of issues. 
blood pressure is a pressure against the walls of a vessel. We know this, right? Okay, and we know um, systolic versus diastolic. So systolic is when the heart is contracting. It's the higher number. Diastolic is when it's relaxing. That's the lower number. I know you know I'm just being complete. Okay, now we can have issues with increased blood pressure. Um, there can be different causes. I think the biggest one is familial hypertension and stress are the two biggest ones. So primary hypertension will be that familial where it's, do we know, is it genetic, is it passed down? We're not quite sure, but his father had it, so he has it now. Um, so define and explain what this does to our blood pressure. Um, what effect does it cause in the heart? Do you think the heart would have an easier or a harder time? Well, if you think about it, the increased vascular resistance is going to cause the heart to work harder, to push blood out of the heart. So it's going to put pressure on the heart as well as systemically with the blood vessels. On the opposite end, we have orthostatic hypotension. Um, you have some people like me who tend to have lower blood pressure anyway. Um, there's really no treatment for it other than eat more salt. Like I can feel when I'm getting lightheaded, I'll have some more salt. But anyway, that's a different topic. I'm sorry. Orthostatic hypotension is a condition that generally happens um, at, with people as they are either really sick and dehydrated, like after vomiting or having a lot of diarrhea. Um, but we see this in elderly. And this is why you care for people um, in homes so carefully, make sure they aren't on the toilet by themselves, getting up and down by themselves, because they can have a drop in their blood pressure with a change in position, usually from lying to sitting or from sitting to standing. They get that drop in the blood pressure. They can get lightheaded, they can pass out. Um, so definitely why we stay with people who need extra help. Chronic venous insufficiency can happen for a multitude of reasons. Um, you know, it could be some sort of damage. It could be varicose veins. Um, it could be damage from an illness. Um, varicose veins are really a, an outcome of it. Um, but here are, with chronic venous insufficiency, some of the signs and symptoms. I'm wondering if I can make this a little bit smaller. Okay, so burning, <clears throat> tingling, you know, um, needles in my achy, tired, cramping, discolored skin that's reddish brown, maybe hyperpigmented, flaking of the skin, leathery looking skin, ulcers, and varicose veins are some of the symptoms that you can have with that. There's a link if you'd like to review it. <laughs> So, lymphatic system, oh, these pictures keep jumping my head. A series of small vessels, people who dissect these out are amazing because they are tiny and hard to find, that run through the body. Lymph nodes, spleen, and bone marrow. more than just muscle. They help to distribute and store white blood cells and also help to return excess fluid from the tissues of the body. It's good to have a basic knowledge of the lymph nodes and their location. So you should probably lymph nodes, cervical lymph nodes, preauricular, postauricular, so, um, inguinal, okay, um, and the vessels you can see are tiny and kind of sneak out there. Spleen is upper left quadrant organ that's tucked back in, sort of underneath the ribs a little bit, 
And that's the one you got to sort of dig for if you think somebody has spleen amygdala. Um, bone marrow, they have that bone cut in half to represent that. And then the drainage of the lymph nodes goes back, I think for our purposes, just knowing it goes back into the venous system. It goes into those subclavicular veins. Um, there's a series of vessels, but that's good for our purposes. All right. So, alterations of cardiovascular function. We already did hypertension, but I want to talk about renin-angiotensin system. <laughs> okay, so you need to know these, but I think this picture is worth a thousand words. Um, I'm going to finish this a little bit, and then I'll up on chapter seven. Okay. Um, okay, right angiotensin system. Okay, so your body has amazing ways to regulate. They don't always make sense. This is one of those things. In this system, a drop in blood pressure sends a series of steps in action from totally different areas. <laughs> the kidneys are actually going to sense the drop in the blood pressure. Kind of weird, I know, but the kidneys are very vascular. The kidneys filter your entire bloodstream every 45 minutes. So now it kind of makes sense, right? They need to have that constant flow of blood. So if blood pressure drops, your kidneys go, hey, I need more blood over here, right? And they'll release renin. Okay, renin is a protein-based um, hormone that will be released into the bloodstream. And what it does is it turns angiotensinogen which is uh, an enzyme that's just waiting around to be put into action. This angiotensinogen will be converted by renin into angiotensin 1. Okay. And this will happen in the bloodstream. Angiotensin 1 doesn't do a ton for us. It really needs to be converted by an enzyme into angiotensin 2. Okay, so ACE, angiotensin converting enzymes, released from the lungs. I know, right? Okay, this is, this is honestly, now that I'm thinking about it and going over it with you guys, one of the weirdest collaboration systems of our whole body, but whatever. So ACE, which is released from the lungs, will convert one to two. Okay, two is a really active form. Two has a direct, <coughs> so moving... So, so far we've done renin, angiotensinogen from the liver, converted to angiotensin 1, to angiotensin 2. This is an inactive form. We don't want to keep this active because we only want it active when we want it active. If that makes sense. Okay, so angiotensin 2. Okay, angiotensin 2 then will release aldosterone, which is a hormone which will act on the kidneys to reabsorb salt. Where salt goes, water goes. We increase the amount of pressure in the cardiovascular system. Because if you stop and think for a second, cardiovascular system is a closed circuit. If we put more fluid into it, we'll raise blood pressure. Amazing, right? And where salt goes, water goes. So aldosterone helps the reabsorption of salt, thereby water. That'll increase systemic blood pressure. It also has, it doesn't have it here believe it will vasoconstrict blood vessels as well not as much as angiotensin 2 but it will okay so they both help with vasoconstriction of blood vessels and so i love this correlation if you look at this versus this so vasoconstriction is a tightening of that blood vessel you can see it's gotten smaller it's just like when you're out with a garden hose in the summer and your husband walks around the corner you're like i'm gonna get him Right? And you put your finger over part of the opening of the hose. That's what you're doing here. You are closing it down, and that will increase the pressure. Okay. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to erase it. Okay. All right. And you can see the difference with vasoconstriction. In both the retention of salt and water, 
and vasoconstriction will increase blood pressure. So this is a standby system that's very, very important. And you can see like if somebody has damage somewhere, either liver or lungs, there could be some issues with this system. Venus insufficiency we spoke about. Um, review that a hormonal birth control side effect in women could be blood clots. I think we all know that. In signs and symptoms of a blood clot. Pathology of an embryo we've gone over. Ischemia is death of a tissue. I apologize. I got so behind on this review. I didn't review it one last time. So some of this is repetition, but nothing's taken out. Okay. Valve heart disorders. Um, valve stenosis is a valve that's narrowed, cannot open properly. Heart has to work harder to pump that blood through that valve. So the blood doesn't move forward as it should and get stuck. Okay. Atria, um, aortic and mitral are more common than tricuspid and pulmonary. Um, rheumatic heart disease, what is the cause of it? Well, you can get strep, beta home like strep in the throat. It causes rheumatic fever due to an overactive response to that infection. Um, the body can actually damage the heart valves as well as connective tissue. Can damage the mitral and or aortic valves. Can also cause endocarditis and heart failure. So, one of the things I have due to an overactive response, I should clarify that <coughs> not a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. When strep spreads, if it's untreated, it can go systemic. Then the body can have an overreactive response to that infection. Okay. And that can cause damage in the heart valves. You can get like deposition on the heart valves and get them damaged. So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay, and more seen in I've heard mostly of mitral, but from what I understand, can be aortic as well. But probably can be anywhere. Anyway, can progress and cause endocarditis, inflammation of the inside of the heart and or heart failure. That's it. Okay. Heart failure, what are tests? Um, what tests are used to diagnose heart failure versus a heart attack? Review that. You have to do a little bit of like work. All right, I'm going to take a little break. We will pick up on Chapter 7 and review the rest of that. Thanks.